this video I want to talk about the origins of New World History. So world history has been around for a long time, right? We trace the origin of history back to Herodotus, but we've seen in all civilizations they have had historians who have recorded the important events of their time seeking to make sense of the world. But before we get to New World History, I want to talk about the origins of historians. Right? We trace the origins of the profession of a historian back to the university system in Germany in the 19th century. This has coincided with the rise of nation states in Europe, and this shaped uh, historians' views. They started looking at history based on the nation. So history as a nation became very central. And we see that they then divided up the history of areas into if it was Europe or, or the United States, it would be um, historians, right? They studied nations. Orientalists studied Egypt, Persia, India, China. Anthropologists studied the remainder of the world, places where we tended to not have as many written records. Okay? But in the 20th century, we start to see some changes, right? And they're going to in the 20th century, the West seems to be dominant, and these theorists want to explain why the West is so dominant compared to other areas in the world. And so we have a couple of very influential models. Um, Weber, with his modernization theory, relies heavily on Protestant ethic, work ethic, and how that creates the environment for Europe to advance. Um, Braudel also brings us back to a larger, as part of the Annals School, a larger perspective, right? He focuses on the Mediterranean basin. It's not based on nations, and it's the long durée. It's still very uh, Eurocentric, though. So now we get to the U.S. So after World War II, the U.S. is the dominant country, well, along with the Soviet Union, and its perspective on world history starts to change as a result of both its new power, but also the changing demographic of the U.S. Right. So in the mid-20th century, there's a number of factors contributing to the growth of world history. People are more aware of the connectedness within world history. And so in the 50s, we see two strands develop. Um, first one, led by people like William H. McNeil, examines the diffusion of ideas. He is... Um, Seminal work is known as is the rise of the West, right? Explaining why the West dominated the world, and then we also have the economic historian um, W. W. Rostow, the comparative, and he wants to know why it's Britain that industrializes and not China. So these are more comparative, but they're still very Eurocentric. Right, so then there's a response. As we know, historiography is always responding to the events of our time, but also to what earlier historians wrote. And so in the 60s, 70s, um, we have the influence of Marx, and we also are looking at systems, world systems, to explain the dominance of Europe. So there are factors that contributed to the emergence of new world history. There is a change in how we view the agency of nation states, and there's also a plethora of information brought about by um, area specialists, also other scholars that are not historians, anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists. These all contribute to the view that world history should be broader. So the characteristics of this new world history that emerges in the 1980s and 1990s is that it seeks to decentralize Europe. So one of the characteristics, decentralizing Europe, doesn't mean that Europe is not part of world history. In fact, a big part of new world history is trying to explain its dominance, but not in ways that attribute superior cultural traits or just being better than the rest of the world, smarter, etc. And so it looks for causes um, and contingencies and accidents of history that help Europe become the dominant and so um, appearing to be advanced in the 20th century. Right. Another thing that that does is also challenges the traditional periodization. 
right? When you take world history courses, it's up until 1500 and then 1500 to the present. When you take a, a introduction to world history course, that up to 1500 is a defining moment because when... So 1500 is selected as a point because that shortly after the Spanish started sailing across to Europe. But it also tended to be when people assumed that Europe became the dominant economic powerhouse. When that is, is in fact not true at all, it was China who was still the driving force in the world economy well into the 1800s. Okay, so the themes of New World History go beyond the nation state. <clears throat> Pardon me. They're trying to look at um, patterns that are cross-national, trans-regional, transnational. So while we see the world history in the 1950s focusing primarily on differences in world regions, in the 1980s and 90s we start to also look for similarities. Okay? New World History also has a very close partnership between K-12 teachers and professional historians and um, university professors. Okay, so one of the big changes we notice is that New World History doesn't have to be centered on political and economic events, right? There's environmental perspective, biological diffusion. Alfred Crosby with his Columbian Exchange and Jared Diamond all contributed greatly to this new... Okay, so some of the influential historians, we are going to be reading some of these in our class and some of them you might have read in other places, but Jerry Bentley, um, you read for this week, and Ross Dunn, uh, Linda Schaefer we'll read next week. Uh, we'll also read some Peter Stearns. Okay, so that gets us to the point about our um, paper, which is going to be due next week before class. So you're going to explain the rise of world history as a professional discipline, address the current scholarly perspectives associated with new world history. So that's what we just talked about being transregional, cross-cultural, things that are not limited to the um, borders. So, for example, immigration, the patterns of you know, people moving. That's an example of a um, scholarly perspective associated with New World History. Right? Discuss what world historians do with specific examples and references from the reading. So, read closely for the cross-cultural exchanges discussed in Bentley for this week, for example. Explain how you might use some of these examples, the way that they look at world history, in your teaching. Right? How can you make uh, the standards, which tend to be very Eurocentric in California for world histories, grades 6th, 7th, and 10th, more global. Use evidence from your readings from weeks 2 and 3, and use Chicago-style footnotes. Okay, so you'll be assessed on the rubric, which is also available in Beachboard, and it looks like this. Right, so there's five categories, the conceptual. This means um, how it all hangs together. You should have an analysis starting with a thesis. Your historical content should demonstrate that you understand world history and your historiography should explain some of the information from the readings that we've read for weeks two and three, not just summarizing, but analyzing them, comparing them, putting them in historical context. And then pedagogically, you should be able to show that you have a couple different ways that you plan to teach the skills. And then obviously, it should be proofread, use academic language, proper citation formats. So I would suggest that you uh, take advantage of the office hours for Josue. Also take advantage of our writers, uh, history writer tutors, writing tutors. Thank you very much for watching.